Hey everyone, Duke Nougat 3 d here with another video relating to my M5 117 Combat Service Mask. And yes, I am, I am calling it that because of additional accessories which I have gotten which would determine the designation as such. So this video is not really going to be a review of the kit as much as it is sort of a, a historical discussion. So I would advise not really paying attention unless you, if you were expecting me to just show off the kit. Uh, this is just mostly going to be talking, but I will show off a few things. So. I bet you're wondering what defers or determines the difference between an E637 and a M5117 uh, Army Assault Gas Mask or Army Combat Service Mask. There's a lot of speculation as to what determines those designations, and I can now tell you after several hours of uh, research and cross-referencing through several documents, uh, I can tell you that the... Um, the masks that were officially carried in the first wave invasion on the landings at Normandy Beach, um, they, the masks carried then were designated the E637. And the way you tell those apart from the M5117 Army Combat Service Mask is mainly just the carrier. Because you see, in January 1944, a recommendation was put in to upgrade the E637's E7 carrier to make it wider by one by one and a half inches, and uh, no, excuse me, make it wider by a half inch lengthwise and a half inch heightwise. I'm probably getting that entirely wrong. If I do, I'll probably update it in the description. I'll put a, I'll put a link to the gas mask wiki down in the description that describes the whole developmental process if you want to sift through all that. But anywho, in January 1944, a recommendation was put forth to upgrade the E7 carrier uh, both lengthwise and heightwise and also to replace the four dot fastener snaps with three lift the dot fasteners. And this new carrier um, which had begun procurement in spring of 1944, was designated the E7R1 and would later become, become known as the M7 carrier. Now, the carrier that was actually used with the E637 during the D-Day invasion was designated the E7, not the M7, as most historians would like you to believe. It is actually E7. So, and, and I'm not just saying that either. I've actually, there, the official technical manual, the... Um, the technical bulletin that was released for, specifically for um, using the E637 Army Assault Gas Mask refers to the carrier as E7 and not M7. So just keep that in mind. The way to tell the difference between E7 and M7 carriers is the rows of snaps mostly. And of course the designation printed on the front, whereas the E7 will say Army Assault Gas Mask and the M7 will say Army Combat Service Gas Mask. Um, getting back into it, though, the, even though the M7 carrier had begun procurement in spring of 1944, the actual um, plans to finalize the E637 with the M7 carrier as the M5117 Army Combat Service Mask were put on halt as well over, like, just under 400,000 E637 masks were procured in anticipation of Operation Overlord, and so the masks that were carried into D-Day and into Holland were the E637, and it was not until June 7th of 1944 when the M5117 began to appear. Um, I should also make note that the M5117 short stopped production shortly Afterwards, I want to say late 1944 is when the mask officially stopped production due to complications in molding the um, the 60 millimeter canister stem on the side of the mask, and it was just a very complicated mask to manufacture. And not only that, the uh, com the Chemical Warfare Service Command in the European Theater of Operations was beginning to get several reports of the masks failing to uh, function properly in colder weather because the the neoprene would stiffen at minus 20 degrees below zero and it would basically be impossible to seal on a user's face unless they warmed it up against their body for at least a minute. Not only that, but the M8 valves also performed poorly in colder climates because the condensate would collect in the valve itself and once the mask was doffed, it would basically freeze over on the valve itself and it would make, if the mask had needed to be donned again, it would it basically meant that the mask would fail to exhale out the valve until it was sufficiently warmed enough. So that being said, the Army began to look into alternative options and basically stopped all production of the M5117 by late 1944, as stated before. 
Uh, my kit, as you can see here, is not entirely complete yet. I am still missing several things, namely the C4 head harness, which, again, I'm still in the process of making a replica for. I found a majority of the materials needed, which are, are I believe, period accurate. I'm going to be ordering samples just to cross-reference and make sure that they are, in fact, period accurate materials for this mask. Uh, and I also need to get an additional um, cover protective individual, one of the one of the gas capes that the U.S. issued. The, two of these were issued with each mask at a time, so I'm actually one short here, and this is like the only one I have. Uh, there's a lot of them on eBay that I'm going to probably order in upcoming months. And I'm also is, uh, missing the M4 protective ointment and the BAL eye ointment as well, as well as two um, gas detection brassards, which... Uh, all three of which will probably have to be reproductions as originals are very uncommon and often in poor condition. That being said, let's get into the carrier itself because I'm sure most of you want to see that. That's basically why I made this video. So the M7 carrier is probably one of the most interesting but ungainly carriers in American gas mass development. As you can see, the entire exterior of the carrier, actually the interior and the exterior, the entire carrier itself is made out of a, um, a typical a cotton duck fabric material which is waterproofed on both sides with a coating of butyl rubber um, and I should note that I believe it is butyl because some technical reports state that the material is butyl um, I'm not sure if all of them were like this but most the only reference I've seen to the specific rubber used on these carriers was butyl so that is kind of interesting to note that they were making carriers out of butyl but the face piece is out of neoprene um, Anywho, so the M7 carrier is a very large and bulky carrier, uh, all things considered. It, it, I found that the only comfortable way to wear this carrier is at the leg. Like, I, it's too big to fit underneath the arm without the strap cinching up somewhere. Uh, I don't like carrying it on the chest, which isn't even a very official way of carrying it anyways, and it doesn't, it isn't conducive to easily accessing the mask. Um, but, anywho, yeah, the leg carrier I found is the most uh, comfortable method of carrying this mask, which I believe was mostly just done by airborne units. Um, I don't know if anyone else did that style of carry, especially not amphibious assault troops. They definitely um, carry it up on the chest or at the side in some cases. Um, as you can see on the front here, stamped in yellow paint. This is not ink. This is actually painted on there with a stamp. Uh, you have the U.S. and the Chemical Corps insignia. Hopefully the bag is not too reflective uh, and is obscuring that. And then below that, obviously, you can see Army Combat Service Mask. You can see the three lift the dot style snaps, which rolled, which are uh, securing a rolled gusset, which keeps the carrier watertight and has actually been known, these carriers, um, they, they serve as a sort of uh, impromptu flotation device, which has actually been credited as saving soldiers' lives on D-Day as the hermetically sealed air in the carriers would keep them afloat if they were dropped into uh, deeper water. Um, and you can see that there are two trapezoidal flaps of the material coming off the back of it, which would retain the, uh, the duck canvas uh, carry straps, which the upper one would obviously be a shoulder strap and the lower one would be a waist strap, although if carrying in the leg carry, the upper strap would be for the waist and the lower would be for the thigh. And speaking of which, they actually anticipated this for being thigh carried because as you can see, there is a longer D-ring and then there's a shorter one. The shorter one was meant to be used for the thigh carry, whereas the longer one was meant to be used for the waist or the, uh, the chest carry. And there really isn't anything to see on the back. Um, you can actually see some remnants of more uh, paint where there was another carrier underneath this when it was unissued. I assume that they were making a great deal of stockpiles of these because the M511-7 was kind of on its last legs of production by the time they had implemented these and so there was basically a lot of stocks of these sit sitting around. And it's also worth mentioning that these carriers were used in the E19 R25 trials, um, which was basically the main prototype for the M9 series field protective masks. And early on in those trials, this was one of the carriers that was considered alongside another carrier called the M7A1, which was more or less just the same as this carrier, except instead of having these straps permanently sewn on, they had grommets on each, four grommets on each of these flaps, two on each one, and that would allow the straps to be removable with the standard snap hook system. However, um, the snap hooks were not very popular with troops as they were very difficult to install, very annoying. And not only that, but the M7A carriers were also made out of a duller, um, a, a non-reflective butyl coating, which was reported to severely impact the donning times of the mask as it, the, the non-reflective butyl coating was a bit tackier than the shiny stuff used on the normal M7. And so... Um, 
Ultimately, the M7 carrier was chosen as the pattern for the later C15 R1 carrier used with the M9 field protective mask when it was finalized in 1947. Um, enough about that, though. You can see the folds of the carriers where it would be stored flat. Um, and as you can see, it's when it's opened up, it sort of it forms sort of a sort of a wedge shape, as you can see. Um, this carrier is very, very big. This is one of the biggest gas mask carriers I currently own. This is about like uh, you probably don't know about this carrier, the the M. 43 Apache aircrew mask carrier. Those things are fucking massive. And this is about like one half the size and one third the capacity. So that's just to give you a perspective if you, if you know what I'm talking about. Anyways, I'm sure you want to see what the inside of the carrier is like. So opening up the flaps, which is actually kind of difficult. It's kind of weird how we've come a long ways um, with uh, gas mask carrier design. So opening up those three snaps, you can see the rolled gusset. Um, where the mask will be stored, there's a bit of reinforcing plastic to help reinforce that uh, roll, obviously. And opening it up, as you can see, I have my Gorka jacket in here. I, have, I need to make a review on my Gorka sometime. I'm not sure when I'm going to get around to that, though, and how I'm going to do it. But anyways, I'm getting... That's a, that's a different topic entirely. So, opening up the carrier, there really isn't much to see in here. The only markings other than what's on the outside is a white D stamp, which might be, be in reference to a manufacturer, however, I'm not entirely sure. And inside the carrier, if I could find the right, right way up here, um, there really isn't much to see. There's like no pockets, nothing inside. The only detail, which I'm not sure if is even showing up on camera, is a little pocket right up there for the anti-fogging kit, um, which really isn't, it's pretty standard on most US gas mask carriers, so it's nothing special to write home about. Um, that being said, that's pretty much all there is to say about this carrier. That's pretty much the entire history I've covered. And again, I will link the gas mask wiki article on the development of the M5117 combat service mask in the description for all you to check out. And I know I said in the last video that I was going to make a restoration post on the U.S. military forum. I have not done that yet. I, I'm actually preferring to wait until I complete the restoration in order to post all the images. So I'm not because like all the past restorations I've posted on the U.S. military forum are not yet complete yet. Just because I again I'm having that issue with the harnesses. I need to rivet new harnesses on, and I'm still waiting to get my rivet press machined so that I can work with U.S. gas masks. But that should hopefully some be sometime later next month. I'm hoping. That's that's really dependent on the people who are dealing with it and not me so again i'll keep you posted on that and that's really all i have to say at this point so if i missed anything feel free to let me know if you have any comments questions corrections or concerns drop them down in the comments below i'm duke nougat 3d and i'll see you all later